Good morning, church. I hope you are doing well. My name is Chris. Again, for those that uh, came in after our prayer time, I'm lead pastor here. Uh, but I say this often, I'm not just lead pastor, I'm one of the pastors because there's a great team uh, of people that are here doing the work that God has called us to do. Um, we don't normally have hot tubs in the service, um, although wouldn't that be awesome? Like if we just sit in the hot tub, watch, you know. Uh, we have some baptisms at the end of our service this morning that I am fired up about. Um, and I'm going to be honest, like I fully believe that God still wants to do more. And so if you have been wrestling, uh, whether accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior today, um, or whether you have never followed through in obedience and baptism, let us know. We, we'd love to add you uh, to the six that we have here. They're going to be baptized uh, at the end of our service this morning. But as we get started, here's what I want you to think about. I want you to imagine waking up um, now, I don't know what that looks like for you. That looks differently in my household. Uh, I wake up, and I feel like somebody shocked my chest with paddles, and I'm like, let's go. I know that's shocking. Um, that's not the same with all of the people in our house. I'm not calling names, Libby, but um, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, I, I want you to imagine whichever way you wake up, the, the way that you wake up is full of purpose and belonging and knowing that you are part of something bigger than yourself. You're not wondering what you need to do, what you're going to do, what you have been doing, but you are envisioning this success that goes way beyond material gains or a success that brings you and continues to fill you with fulfillment in every area of your life. Picture a life rich in meaningful experiences. And not just the experiences that you want to have, but like, man, you feel real purpose in the experiences that you have. And above all, consider that this journey that you are on leads you to discover what we all lean, like, long for, which is true purpose and true meaning. Like, you know that you were created for this day, for this thing you're about to step into. Now, here's the thing that's hard. Because if we're being really honest, most of us don't wake up like that. We're trying to get the eye boogers out of our eye. We're thinking about the three or four things we forgot about that we got to do that now has changed our morning, which now has set us off to the people that are around us because somehow, some way, even though it wasn't their fault, it's their fault. They're guilty by association, right? I forgot to write this thing down, so now all of a sudden it's your fault some type of way, and so I'm not waking up with that. Have you ever, like, maybe... Maybe a lot of times we wake up and we feel like we've put a puzzle together, but we're missing a piece to the puzzle. Have you done that? Maybe it looks like this picture above. We have like, have you ever created a puzzle and then you have one piece left, but you're like, oh, that's green and, and that puzzle piece is blue. That puzzle piece doesn't go there. <laughs> doesn't life sometimes feel like that? Like we got all these other things going on, but I'm missing a piece to the puzzle and I've got the wrong puzzle pieces over here and they ain't going right there. And too often we do that day after day after day after day, we're missing a piece of the puzzle. I was recalling one time that my family and I were putting a puzzle together. That was a terrible decision. <laughs> I have four kids and they were young at this point. And, and it was like, we're doing, like, well, you know, we're going to get together as a family today, and we're going to put a puzzle together. It's going to be joyous and worshipful, and we're going to praise God at the end of it. And we were at each other's throats. But somebody's doing the edges. The other one's randomly doing the middles. Like, it's like, what, what is happening? And I'm over here going, whoa, 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 whoa. Who said you could do this? And then we get near the end, and we realize that we're, we actually are missing some pieces to the puzzle which is, it's okay, because calmly you're like, well, that's all right. The Lord will provide. No, I'm like, what? See, if you guys put your stuff where the things belonged, if you cleaned up the way you needed to clean up, we wouldn't be missing any puzzle pieces right now. Like in my heart, that was what was going on, right? But then we found the puzzle piece, and it was like, hallelujah, praise Jesus. Woo! We've, I mean, like I felt so accomplished, and all we did was find a puzzle piece, have you ever felt like you're missing that puzzle piece in your life every day when you wake up? And I think that's our spiritual journey, isn't it? Sometimes we wander around. Sometimes we're just like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna check out church. Let's see what this does. I think this would be good. Maybe you're like me as a young child. I, I was a CEO, Christmas and Easter only type of follower of Christ. 
and, and walking through. And so maybe you're like, okay, if I go these couple of times a year, maybe this will get good. It'll get a little bit better. And, and you're still wandering around searching for something. Maybe you start to read the Bible a little bit and you're like, okay, it's kind of weird. When did this happen again? Long time ago. You're trying to understand it because everybody just told you, hey, just read the Bible and you'll be fine. So you pick up like Leviticus and Numbers. You're like, I don't know, what is happening right now? So you're searching for something more. If I'm honest, a lot of our spiritual journey is what I, a lot of people have said this before, but what I like to just say, it was, it was a get out of hell free card. Kind of like playing Monopoly. You didn't want to go to that place that everybody was talking bad about, spiritually disconnected from God, weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so you're like, hey, what can I do to get out of this? And so you, you became a follower of Christ, but for you, it was more like, do not, I mean, like, here, here's your get out of jail free. This is the get out of hell free card. And so the rest of your life, you're just trying to find a little bit more in your spiritual journey. Can I remind us of something this morning? We were not just saved from something. We've been saved to something. Yes, we were saved from our sin and the consequences of that 100%. But we were not just saved from something. We were also saved to something. And I think a lot of us are wandering around looking for the missing piece of the puzzle because we have not figured out what we were saved to yet. So this morning, one of the things I want to accomplish is to help you understand that God has not just saved you from something if you're a follower of Christ. He saved you to do something, like you are a part of something bigger than yourself. There's something when you wake up every morning that you can have meaning and purpose and fulfillment in greater than you've ever experienced in your entire life, and that's living the Jesus life for him and for the kingdom of God. We've been walking through a series that we've called Refresh Your Rhythms. New year, we all like a little refreshment into the things that we're supposed to do, some new rhythms into those things that we were supposed to do. And so we've been walking through Refresh Your Rhythms where we've been talking about um, the 5% life. If you're new with us, our mission here at Riverside and our Riverside Church family, we're a one church in multiple locations in multiple languages. Right now, we have an Espanol service going on in our chapel. Tonight, we have an Indonesian service. This morning, we had a service in the Central Park area at our Journey Point location. And all of us try to do one thing with people, and that's lead them to live the Jesus life. So we are leading them to live the Jesus life. We try to do that uh, in, a, in a couple of distinctive ways. We want everyone and everything that they do to encounter Jesus, grow together, discover purpose, and impact others. So you're going to hear that a lot in our church family, but the one thing that you will hear even more than that is the understanding that a lot of this that takes place happens within me first. I don't just wait on the church to do it. It happens within me, and that's living the 5% life. It's the life that Jesus lived. And what we say is that we believe that if you'll live the 5% life, the other 95% of your life will be forever changed. So week one, we talked about God time. That's 1% of your day spent in time in fellowship with the Father through prayer or reading of the word. The next week, we talked about 1% of your week in gather time. Gather time is what we're doing right now. It's about an hour to an hour and a half gathering together with the body of Christ to come to worship God and all that we're doing, singing to the top of our lungs and praising God for who he is and hearing from his word. Last week, we talked about 1% of your month, which is in group time. That's six to seven hours of your month spent intentionally in spiritual community, not, not your community at work, not your community at the ball fields, not your community on the basketball court, not at the CrossFit gym, but, but community, spiritual community that's helping you grow into God, who God wants you to be. And today, we're going to talk about our 1% of our quarter, which would be about one day, it equates to about a day's worth of growing in our personal and spiritual journey. That's knowing who God called me to be and doing what God called me to do and growing in those gifts and abilities for the kingdom of God, not for me. And then next week, we're going to wrap it up by talking about our 1% go time, which is spending about a week serving locally, nationally, or internationally for the kingdom of God. This past week, we talked to Eric and Carrie Curlin, who are in Tokyo and got to catch up with them and, and, and understand what it means to go because God calls us to go. And so we've been walking through this. And so today, what I want to do is talk about our personal and spiritual journey, our own personal and spiritual leadership journey of who God desires us to be and how God desires to use us. And a lot of that comes into finding out 
our true meaning and our true purpose, knowing that missing piece of the puzzle. And so what I want to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about some common challenges we all have with finding true purpose and living out our true purpose and some areas that show that we're looking for purpose in our lives. And we're going to talk about what God says about it. And then we're going to break down um, some, some S's of self-discovery of how we can begin to live out the way God wants us to live out our daily lives. And can I remind you of something? None of what I'm going to say today happens without prayer in the Holy Spirit. You can do what you want to do. You can do what everybody else wants you to do. But if you are not doing what God wants you to do, then you are missing the boat. And so it's a divine encounter with a living God. Let me pray. And before we jump into this, ask God to just be with us here this morning. Father, we love you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for your love, your encouragement, your strength, your truth, your wisdom. God, thank you for your word. I thank you that you, Lord, have called us to do certain things with the gifts that you've given us. Everything I am and all that I have, the gifts and abilities are yours that you've given me. And the same thing is true for every single one of the people in the room. And so I pray that you would use them to the best of their ability to do the work that you've called them to do for the kingdom. God, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you, and it's in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the show Chosen, The Chosen, I love The Chosen. I'm not a very creative person, and so when I watch a show like The Chosen, I'm like naturally engaged in things that I would not naturally think about, and I love like watching the, the ribbing and the bantering between the disciples. Like Peter, Peter would be my guy. Everybody would hate Peter, but I'd be like, dude, Peter, you and I are boys, you know? He's like, he's, and it's like the chosen brings out this creative element in there that it's like, man, you have to think about these types of things that happen. We, we have a small snapshot of what actually happened in the life of Jesus. The chosen is bringing out this like, oh man, this is probably wild what happened. And one of the things that makes me do is read scripture with a little bit different lens because I like to kind of put myself into the scriptures and think about things I normally wouldn't think about. One of those verses that comes to life to me that just kind of blows my mind a little bit is Luke chapter two, verse 52. Luke, 52, or Luke 2, 52 says this, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with people. I pray this every morning for my kids. Lord, that you would be with them. Lord, you would grow them in wisdom and in stature and help them and give them favor with man and with you. But what I start to think about is like, this is Jesus. You ever thought that Jesus needed to grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with man and with people? It's wild to me. Also, like, could you imagine having to teach Jesus anything? Like, could you imagine being Joseph, having to teach Jesus how to read? Think about that. It's like, hey, come on, man. Get it together. Aren't you the son of God? Right? Like, this is what I'm thinking in my mind. Like, hold up. Like, also, why do I need to teach you? What can you teach me, Jesus, as a, like, eight-year-old child? But Jesus needed to increase in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with people to do what it was that God was calling him to do. Can I tell you something? I don't care who you are, where you've been, what you've done, how long you've been doing it. You need to grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with people. No matter how long you've been on this journey, you need to grow in the gifts and the abilities that God has given you so that you can use them for the kingdom of God. If Jesus needed it, you do too. Do me a favor, look to your neighbor and say, you need it. Now you look to them and be like, you need it too, man. Like, and say it with a little salt behind it, right? Like, hey, man, the watch. I'm just kidding. Don't do that. We're in church. So with that in mind, I'm going to walk through some common challenges that you and I face when it comes to finding our purpose. This is everyday life, me and you in 2024. There's five challenges. I think when you study psychology and cultural norms, they'll show you that this is true, that we fight and we have a challenge to finding our actual purpose. It actually reveals that we're fighting and challenging to find our purpose. The first one is this, career dissatisfaction. Some of you said amen. If your boss is here, don't say it loud. Career dissatisfaction. You either know someone or you are someone that has some dissatisfaction with the career that you are in right now. As a matter of fact, 53% of American workers actually report today feeling dissatisfied with their jobs. You know what this does? It highlights the widespread quest for greater fulfillment and purpose 
not just in life, but even more specifically in our careers. We're, we're searching for something more. Man, I got this job and I thought it was going to answer what I was looking for. Guess what? It didn't. Now I'm looking for something else. Can I give you a hint? You're going to be looking for something else for a long time if that's where you're finding your purpose. Career dissatisfaction. Second thing is this, fear of regrets. And you know, anybody, just do me a favor. If you've, had, if you've ever had a fear that at some point you were going to regret the things you did, just raise your hand right now. Now keep your hand raised. Look to the people without their hand raised and say, you're a liar. Because you are. We all have this fear that we're going to do things that we regret doing later on in our life. I think a lot of us would say, man, I don't want to get to 80 and look back and go, I wish I would have done the things that I really felt God calling me to do. Because that's a fear of regret. Surprisingly, 76% of people express a fear of regrets in their later years in life, which then motivates them to seek a more meaningful and purposeful path in their life today. We're trying to find purpose. Desire for impact. Anybody want to impact others? And I think we get these terms impact and influence different. Did you know that you can in, have, have influence, aka social media and followers and all these things, and have no impact? Did you know that you could also impact a lot of people and nobody know who you are? But I think at the, at the core, we all want to have this desire for impact. I was studying this this week, and I found that 94% of millennials... Now, I know what some of you are thinking, millennials, those millennials, everybody gets a trophy generation. There's they, like, listen, millennials have been just destroyed in society and in like news and stuff like that. Can I, here's a crazy stat. The oldest millennial is 42 years old. They're not in their 20s anymore, right? Um, I am a geriatric millennial. And I have a problem saying that. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even joking. I wish I was. So they have two names for people born when I was born. I'm 43. I was born in 1980. They have a subsect of people that were born from 78 to 82. And they've pulled them out because of the influence of technology in their lives. And they're calling them geriatric millennials. I don't want to be called geriatric in anything. Um, and it's like, I know it's going to come. Can I just wait until that day comes? Not now. So the other term is zennial. So please call me a zennial, not a geriatric millennial. But did you know that 94% of millennials, a generation known for its desire for purpose, actually express a strong aspiration to use their talents and skills to make a positive impact in the world? We got to stop thinking of them as somebody God can't use and start going, hey, God wants to use you. The fourth thing is comparison problems. Another case study, anybody ever compared themselves with anybody else? Raise your hand. You're all raising it now, so you know, because if you're not, you're for sure lying. We compare and compare and compare and compare and compare to everyone and everybody else. And the day and age that we live in now is even easier to compare because we see everybody's best and we compare it to our worst, particularly with things like social media. In the age of social media, 60% of people admit to experiencing negative emotions due to constant comparisons with others, driving the search for genuine meaning beyond surface level success. Libby calls OCD obsessive comparison disorder. And a lot of people have it. And you know the funny thing about social media? I got two quick jokes for you. What's, why is social media like a refrigerator? I know, just follow me. You keep opening it, even though you know there's nothing new inside. You're like, we haven't bought groceries in a week. I just thought something was gonna jump into that fridge, and it's not. And I keep opening up social media and hoping it makes me feel better about myself, but it doesn't. The joke hurts a little bit too much. Social media and a refrigerator also have something else in common. They both have a way of making us stare into them while we're bored, hoping something magical will happen. It's exactly what we do. Comparison disorder hurts, but also shows our need for purpose. And then the last, but certainly not least, is a lack of clarity for the future. We want and we need clarity, but we have a lack of it. 47% of people struggle with a lack of clarity regarding their future direction, which then prompts them to seek guidance and purpose in their life journey. More people are searching for purpose than you know or maybe even you yourself want to admit. And what we need to do is look at what God says about the purpose that he has for us. 
If you have a copy of the Bible, do me a favor, turn to Matthew chapter 4. We're going to be in two passages this morning. The first one, Matthew 4, verses 18 through 22, and then Ephesians 4, 11 through 13 as well. In Matthew 4, this is the calling of the disciples. The title in my Bible says the first disciples. And I'm fascinated with what happens here because these are men that Jesus is calling in to do the work that he is calling them to do. This is like, hey, come be a part of something. Come wake up with purpose, with meaning, with direction, with all the things that you've been desiring for a really long time. Come and let's do that. And so it says here in verse 18, it says, as he was walking along the Sea of Galilee, And by the way, reminder, we want to look at Jesus living in this out because this is the Jesus life and Jesus calls people into more purpose. So we want to call people and ourselves into more purpose for their lives. And it says, as he was walking along, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter and his brother, Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. If you want to, in your mind, you can say they were failures. Here's what I mean. To the world around them, they were failures if they were fishermen. Because in this culture, when they were growing up, they, the longing and desire for every Hebrew boy was to grow up and be in rabbinical school and walk through rabbinical school. If you were a fisherman at this point in your life, it means you failed rabbinical school. So there's seminary dropouts, and Jesus is not walking by going, failure, failure, failure. He's going, okay, you can be used, and you can be used, and yep, you're right where you need to be. Come on and follow me. And so what I'm saying here is if you felt like a failure in your life before, you're probably right where Jesus wants you. Don't look at what the world says as your success because Jesus is saying, I don't care where you've been or what you've done. I want you to come and follow me. So he says they were fishermen and he says in verse 19, follow me. Could you imagine? Just son of God looking at you. He's like, Phillips, follow me. I'd be terrified. But he doesn't even just stop there. Follow me, he told them, and I will make you fish for people. It's almost as if he's saying, come with me, and I'm going to lead you to something else. I'm not just getting you to come with me just to come with me, but I'm getting you to come with me so that you can go to do something else that I have in store for you. He says, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. Immediately. Not like, oh, well, hey, I'm not ready. You know, I'm a dropout. I failed rabbinical school. Hey, can I, can I, what if I would, can I just get a little more training and understanding of the things that I need to be doing? I really just wish I knew a little bit more. If I knew a little bit more, maybe I could be used for you in that thing that you're trying to do. You know, if I just went to this class or if I went to this course or if I finished this thing, then if, if I could just do that, then maybe you could use me. No, 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 no. They immediately, they left their nets and followed him. They left their trade, they left everything else and followed Jesus. Then in 21, it says, going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with Zebedee, their father, preparing their nets, and he called them, more fishermen, more failures. This time, they're with dad in the family business. Can you imagine? And so they said, hey, can we just help my dad out a little bit, and then we'll come? hey, let me go back to rabbinical school, see if I can do it again and learn a little bit more before you want me to do what you want me to do and then I will go. No, 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 it says in 22, immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. This is a declaration of God's intention for our lives. He, Jesus here didn't just invite his disciples to escape some ordinary life, to escape the job they had dissatisfaction with, to escape their current reality or their current circumstance and their ordinary life of fishing. He was calling them to a life of purpose and a transformational journey for their life. And can I tell you something? He's calling you to do the same thing. He didn't merely save them from some mundane existence. He didn't save them to do something just a little bit different until that wore out too, then they could do something else. He saved them to become fishers of men to impact lives and to join him on the divine mission. By the way, I love this as well too. We talked about disciple making last week. Do you know that the real gauge of spiritual maturity of followers of Jesus is not what they know, is not the lures that they can make 
but it's their ability to catch men, women, and children that do not know him. The real gauge of spiritual maturity is people that have a heart for casting out the line and grabbing people that are not in relationship with the person and work of Jesus Christ. It's having a heart for their one. I can gauge the spiritual maturity of someone by their heart for those that are, in, are not in a relationship with Jesus Christ, those spiritually disconnected from him. Not the people that can make fishing lures all day long. And we have a lot of people in this country that can make fishing lures all day long in terms of their spiritual maturity. And it's time to cast the nets. And Jesus says, come in to do this. You know what he was doing? He was giving them clarity. He was giving them purpose. He was giving them impact. He was giving them satisfaction for their life. He didn't call them from something. Guess what he was doing? He was calling them to something. That's what Jesus does. And this is a fundamental truth about our salvation. Like, we are not just about being saved from our sin and our consequences. Yes, we are saved from our sin and the consequences of our sin, but it's also vitally important to know that we are following and going into a life of meaning and purpose that Jesus is calling us into. We are saved from our sin and our consequences and to a life of meaning and purpose. God has a unique plan for each of us, each and every one of us, just as he did for these fishermen alongside the Sea of Galilee. He invites us to follow him, not merely to escape the world, by the way. This isn't just to go home from a long day of a job that we didn't like and to just binge watch Netflix and just hang out. It's to live life with a unique purpose that God designed for us to live. Do you know that you are unique? Can you do me a favor? Look to your neighbor and say, I'm not like you. Now, with a little salt, look back at your other neighbor and say, I'm not like you either. God uniquely created us. And in that uniqueness, he has a unique plan and path for our life to be used for his honor and his glory. Our salvation is a call to a higher purpose, a life dedicated to serving the kingdom of God. That's what a follower of Jesus' life is about. One of my favorite passages in all of the Bible that talks about this is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. Ephesians 4, 11 through 13 is a quintessential verse about leadership development and our spiritual journey. But it takes an understanding, maybe in a fresh lens. And so this morning, even if you've heard it, I want you to look through it with a fresh lens with me. It says this in chapter 4, verse 11, and he himself... Don't forget that. Just put a pen in that, underline that, circle that in your Bibles. Gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Those pastors in your Bibles may say shepherds. This is known as the apest, apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers. These are the gifts that are given out, the apest gifts that are given. It says that they are given out by he himself. In verse 12, to equip the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son. Growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Did you catch this? The purpose of the gifted people wasn't to do the gifts on their own. The purpose of the gifted people was to use the gifts to equip the saints to do the work of ministry. Many of you know Pastor Tim at our Journey Point location. He's like the professional Christian. I'm not, and it's okay. Pastor Tim was called to ministry at an early age, served in ministry for a really long time. I was called to try and to figure it out for a really long time until God finally put me in full-time vocational ministry. We were talking about this a couple of weeks ago in our teaching meeting, and one of the things that is fascinating about this is the church in America has sometimes looked at these gifts and these professional pastors and church leaders as the ones that are, yes, gifted and to do those work. They're like, they're like the Navy SEALs of Christianity. When God called me into full-time ministry, Libby had one of her friends that sent her a text message and said, this is amazing. I'm so excited for you guys. Now you can pray for me. Like as if I was a pastor, I have some special access to God that nobody else has. That's not the way it works. There's no professional and non-professional Christian. This is just the vocation that God has called me to. 
We're supposed to do these things and this work no matter what. And guess what it shows us? It shows us three areas here that we can focus on. Unity in the faith, unity of faith and knowledge of God's son, maturity, and then Christ's fullness. By the way, maturity here is not measured in my own spiritual maturity, my own knowledge, my own understanding, my own gathering of all of this information, but it's in relationship to the church and how that maturity is played out in the life of the local church. Because God's plan for the world is the local church. Don't ever forget it. God's plan for the world is the local church. So we got to ask ourselves, are we as a church maturing? Not my personal maturity, but how are we maturing and using that maturity for the body of Christ? I think one thing I want to note here is a lot of times we read these verses and we look at verse 11, verse 12, and verse 13, and in our mind, we're like, you know what, God? I think you got this wrong. It should actually be 11 and then 13 and then 12. If you could just revisit that, it would be awesome. Now, some of you are like, what do you mean? Here's what I mean. A lot of us think that, okay, these gifts are given and we're called to do the work of ministry, but we often say, I'm not ready to do the work of ministry because I'm not mature enough. What that would read is a Ephesians 4, 11, then 13, then 12. God, give the gifts mature the followers of Christ, then let's see the work of ministry done. And so we've gotten this wrong for a really long time. We're like, no, uh, I'd really love to, but I have not memorized the entire Bible yet, pastor. <laughs> Nobody's actually ever said that to me. But I think sometimes we believe it. You know, I'd really love to share my faith, pastor, but I don't know if I'm gonna be able to answer all the questions. You know, I'd really love to serve in this area. I just don't think I'm good enough. Do you know that God doesn't call the qualified, but he actually qualifies the called? If God called the qualified, would he ever have picked some dropout seminary students that are now fishermen that couldn't pass rabbinical school? No, because God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. And if you don't feel qualified right now, you're right where the Lord wants you to be. You know what I didn't do before I planted a church? Plant a church. <laughs> and so if somebody was like, oh, hey, I think you, you ought to be a church. Man. I'm sorry. I have actually never planted a church before. I am not mature enough to do that. Now, I might not be mature enough to do that, but that's another story for another day. But if I was like waiting until I had the experience to do that, I would never do it. You know, a lot of times parents and, and would often tell you this would be very true to young couples, to young men and women that are married and looking to start a family. Like a lot of times they're like, well, I'm just going to wait till we're ready to have kids. <laughs> I am 43. I have four kids. I'm still not ready. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> If you are waiting until you are ready to get whatever it is that you are looking to be ready for to do what it is that God is calling you to do, that's not the way my Bible reads. My Bible actually reads that you are given gifts to do the work of ministry, and then as you're doing the work of ministry, then we see unity and maturity come. If I would have waited until I was ready to be a pastor, I would never know any of you. I would never know the people that gave their lives to Christ over the last couple of years. I'd never know these six people that are proclaiming their relationship with Jesus Christ today. I can't even imagine what I would miss out on if I was waiting until I was ready. Church, don't wait. Step out. You're not ready, but you know who is? The Lord and he can use you and wants to use you. He didn't just call you from something, he called you to something. I think a lot of this is because, I just wanna, wanna geek out to the Bible nerds in the room just a little bit. If you don't mind, just give me like two minutes to geek out to why I think our church in America has gotten this wrong and even across the world has gotten this wrong for a, a bit of time. 
And it's because when you originally look at this now, what I'm about to say, I need to be careful because what I'm about to say is not a knock on this translation of the Bible. It's just a knock on this particular verse translation of the Bible that got it wrong for a long time, and that's the King James Version. If you look at the King James Version of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, if you look at it, it's on the bottom side. Look at it. It says, walking through this, right, the apest, giving the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. Notice the comma. For the work of ministry, comma, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The way that reads is professional Pastor Tim is the professional, Chris the professional, others the professional. They are to do the perfecting of the saints, do the work of the ministry, do the edifying of the body of Christ. The comma is wrong because when you really capture it, it's what the CSB translation says above. Those people are to equip the saints, guess what? No comma, for the work of ministry. Do me a favor, look to your favorite neighbor, say, you're the saint. Now, you know what's coming. Look to your other neighbor, say, you're not my favorite, but you're a saint too. You have people that are ready, willing, praying for you to be equipped for the work of ministry so that we can have a building up of the body of Christ. The church can't be built up when it's just the green beret, Navy SEAL church leaders that are doing this types of things, but it's the saints because the church is the people. So what I wanna do is I want you to understand that God has a purpose and a plan for you, but he also wants to equip you for that. So where do I begin? So very easily in very pastory fashion, I've got four S's of self-discovery. Real quick, based on Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. Four S's of self-discovery. The first one is this, seek. You're gonna have to seek. You know what it says in the very beginning of that in verse 11? And he himself doesn't say Pastor Chris, doesn't say Adam, doesn't say Hunter, doesn't say Sarah, doesn't say anybody else. It says, and he himself gave these gifts. And so when you begin this journey of self-discovery to how God wants to use you and can use you for the way that he designed and created to use you, begin by seeking clarity from him about the gifts that he's given you, the passions that he's given you, the strengths that he's given you. Doesn't mean that what other people says isn't important, but if you don't start with the Lord, the giver of the gifts that you have, you're starting off on the wrong foot. So begin by seeking him. Lord, what strengths and abilities and gifts and passions have you given me that I need to fan the flame on to do the work that you have called me to do? The second S is sift. We live in Colorado, a lot of gold mining that has happened. We know what sifting is. You sift through your experiences and reflect on what truly matters to you. Think back to apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teacher. Are you more apostolic in nature? Are you like, go, 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 drive, 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 goals, 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 let's get it done? Sound familiar? Are you more prophetic in nature with a prophetic word of, man, I believe this is going to happen and this is what God says in and through his teaching? Are you more evangelist? Man, you can talk to a brick wall about the personal work of Jesus Christ. Now, if the brick wall talks back, you got problems. Let somebody know. Just kidding. Are you more shepherding and nurturing and caring in nature? Are you more teaching? You love to expound on the teaching of God, sift through. What is it? You can't be all of them. Like you can have a part of doing all of them, but your primary gift can't be just all of them. It's probably one of them, so sift through what God has given you. Seek him, sift through it. The, second, uh, the third S is this, set. Set clear goals and intentions for your personal leadership journey. You know that if you aim for nothing, you're gonna hit it every time? And so if you walk out of this, and you go, man, it was a great message, it was really good. But you don't say to yourself, man, I really need to be praying to God. You know what? Tomorrow morning, I'm going to wake up and I'm going to pray to God and ask him to show me what it is that he's given me. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to, I'm going to sift through the experiences that I've had and see how I can be used. For his. If you don't make a decision right now to set clear goals, to grow in this area of your life, you're never going to grow in this area of your life. Set some clear goals and expectations. He says, equip the saints for the work of ministry. Maybe set some goals to how you can do the ministry that God has called you to do. Hey, God, I want to go serve in this area to see if this is what you've called me to. I want to go shake hands at the door to be a warm and welcoming face to people that are coming in to our church family. 
I want to work with kids. I want to help teach them the word of God. Whatever it is, set some goals to do it. And the fourth thing is this, serve. The ultimate, ultimate goal is unity in the faith and maturing. You need to serve others and your community with the unique gifts that you've been given. Do you know that our church can never properly function unless the body of the church is using the gifts that God has given? We can't. There's arms and feet and hands and eyes and ears and mouths all throughout this room right now. We can never be the church that God has called us to be without all of us using the gifts that God has called us to use for the kingdom of God. We'll never reach Denver. We'll never reach the West. We'll never reach the the world if we do not have a body of people using the gifts that God has given them to do the work that he has called them to do. And don't forget, it says equip the saints for the work of ministry, then maturity, not maturity, then the work of ministry. I believe in my heart, down to the bones, that some of you are waiting to be more mature to do the things that you desire and see God wanting you to do, and God is waiting on you to serve to mature you. Some of you are going, man, I'm just waiting until I'm a little bit more mature in this area to do this thing I really feel you calling me to do, God, and God is going, I'm really just waiting on you to get out and serve. Because if you read my word in Ephesians 11, uh, 4, 11, 12, and 13, it says that when you serve, that's when you're going to mature. As I've walked this path of self-discovery and service, even myself, I remember the event that we did, that we made a def- decision as a husband and wife that we were not gonna do things on our own, but we were gonna give back to the kingdom of God and for his glory in the way that radically shaked me, shook me, and changed my life. We leveled a football field that I grew up playing on in an area of the city that the church we were doing it with was never going to get people to go to church from that area of the city. But they were serving that community because they wanted those people to know that God loved them. And being a part of something like that, a part of something bigger than myself, how could God orchestrate that the first thing I would do would be to level a football field I actually grew up playing on in a community that I didn't like the name of that church that was doing it? God, that's how. I felt like a seminary dropout because I was. Wasn't raised in a church home, didn't have the church pedigree and all these types of, I didn't learn the names of the Bibles, the books of the Bible, the song, right? You know, it's like, you know, you know the books of the Bible by the song. I, like, those people got on my nerves because I'm like, well, I didn't get all of that. One of them was my wife. She knew it. She'd just rattle it off. I'm like, ugh. I was not who God could use. And God was going, man, I want you. You'll just take a a step and do what I'm calling you to do. Because I didn't just save you from something. Chris, I saved you to something. Church, he didn't just save you from something. He saved you to something. Something greater than you can possibly imagine. And he is waiting on you to jump out and to begin serving. And to begin growing in the gifts and the abilities that he has given you and only you. Like, do you think that G- Jesus could have come and just done what he wanted to do and accomplish all of that without having to call a bunch of people like you and I? But he came, lived a sinless life, only to be put on a cross he didn't deserve to be put on, to die a death that he did not deserve to die, that we actually deserve to be on, that we deserve to die because of our sin. And God sent him to do that so that you and I could have a right relationship with him, yes, so that we can escape the the power of sin that it has on our life and the consequences of being eternally separated from him if we don't have a right relationship, but also, church, but also to do the work that God has called us to do, to recognize that that gospel message, his death, his burial, and his resurrection came to me not to stay with me, but on its way to someone else. He wants to use you so bad and he wants to see you wake up with purpose and fulfillment and joy and meaning in everything that you do. He is the missing piece of the puzzle, church. Whatever you're looking for, whatever experience you're longing for, whatever belonging you are longing for, whatever success you are driving for, whatever purpose you are looking for right now, I'm telling you, it is the person and work of Jesus Christ. 
There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And today we are going to celebrate six people that know that to be true. And I'm praying and hoping that there's more. As we get ready to, to go into worship before we baptize, I, wanna, I just want to do a quick reminder of what baptism is because we live in a city where 95% of people are spiritually disconnected from Christ. We live in a city where most people are like, man, I got no idea what this means, what this is. And so I just want to briefly walk through, like, why do we get baptized and, and what is baptism at its core? Baptism is for those that have said yes to following Jesus. Baptism is a, a powerful symbol that represents our faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. It's an outward expression of an inward reality. It's much like my wedding ring. If I take this wedding ring off right now, am I still married? Well, hold up. It's because this is an outward expression of an inward reality of the love and the covenant and commitment I made to my wife, Libby, and the love and the covenant and the commitment that she made to me. Baptism doesn't save us, but it, was an, it is an outward expression of an inward reality that we are saved and have said yes to following Jesus. And so why? Why do we get baptized? One is obedience. The Lord commands us to follow through in baptism after we have come into a right relationship with him. You know who it was good enough for? Jesus. And if it was good enough for Jesus, praise God, it's good enough for me. Because he calls us and commands us to do it. It's identification. Baptism is a way for us to identify with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. We immerse ourselves in the water in baptism, and we are raised into new life, symbolizing dying to our old way of life and being buried with Christ and being raised into a new way of life. We weren't just saved from something, but we've been saved to something. It's a reminder of our cleansing and our forgiveness. Baptism represents cleansing and forgiveness of our sins. It doesn't wash away. I mean, it, it, it doesn't do the work to wash away our sins. That's from our faith in Jesus Christ, but it signifies through our faith in Jesus Christ, our sin is forgiven and we are made clean before God. Last but certainly not least, it's a public declaration. Baptism is a public declaration of our faith. It's like wearing that wedding ring, like I said, letting everybody know this outward expression of this inward reality of what is happening in my life. And so the Bible, uh, the Bible teaches that baptism should follow a person's decision to follow him. It should follow a person's decision to trust in the personal work of Jesus Christ, believing in his death, burial, and resurrection, asking for forgiveness of sins and knowing that God is faithful to forgive and then saying yes to him, leading your life. It's about our faith in Jesus and letting everybody else know we've said yes. It's a beautiful step in the journey of faith. It's a public testimony of our commitment to Jesus. And church, I wanna remind you today that if you have never, one, said yes to following Christ, like today is your day. You won't find success belonging experience or purpose and anything else that you're trying to find it in like you will find it in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Your job is not the missing piece of the puzzle. Your career is not the missing piece of the puzzle. Your spouse, even your kids are not the missing piece of the puzzle. He is the missing piece of the puzzle. And today is today to say yes to following him, to start living a life of meaning and purpose. And then two, if you've never been baptized, and I'm gonna tell you what, Come down here. I'm just going to be down here with my family at the end of this service. Ladies, men, we have some people that can talk to you as well. If you've never followed through in baptism, I promise you, today is your day. If you're like, man, I, I, we'll give you a shirt. We have a couple pairs of shorts. We'll give it to you. I tell you what, if, it, if it's clothes, it'll buy, I'll buy you a new outfit. Be careful. I like Lululemon. But if you've never followed through, and being baptized after saying yes to following Jesus, today's your day. You don't need to wait. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna sing. We're gonna sing one more worship song. We're gonna worship through singing. As we do, I want you to cry out. And I want you to sing and praise and honor and glorify God. But I also want you to step into doing what God has called you to do. Think about this. Start setting some goals for how you can step into doing what God has called you to do. Because only you can do what God has called you to do.